Good afternoon. We continue today with another relatively advanced and relatively technologically mature aspect of contemporary learning systems, the technology, knowledge graphs, and the adaptivity it supports, prerequisite and postrequisite selection. So let's start with what a knowledge graph is. Um, according to uh, Baker and his colleagues, knowledge graphs or spaces provide an ontology or a model of the knowledge and skills needed for a specific task or domain knowledge and they're used to select what content a student should work on next. A few notes. First of all, a knowledge space is a type of knowledge graph. All knowledge spaces are knowledge graphs, but not all knowledge graphs are knowledge spaces. The only real difference between knowledge spaces and other types of knowledge graphs, like Bayesian networks, is the mathematics under the hood. That math isn't really important for this class, but I'm going to discuss its implications a little bit later in the session. What's a prerequisite? A prerequisite is a skill a concept or a knowledge component that's required to learn a different skill, concept, or knowledge component. So for example, you have to learn addition before you learn multiplication, so addition is a prerequisite for multiplication. A prerequisite knowledge graph shows the relationship between skills specifically focused on mapping out those prerequisite relationships, so that for every skill we can see its full context um, in the skills that lead up to it and the skills that follow it. One type of prerequisite knowledge graph are partial order knowledge spaces, or POCs. And specifically, in a POX, there's only one way to learn a piece of knowledge. Other types of knowledge graphs might allow multiple paths. In other words, you might be able to know X or Y to learn Z. Now, POX still allows for multiple prerequisites, but it's AND relationships. In POX, you might say that a skill Z requires a X and Y, but not X or Y. One of the most widely used uh, learning systems that uses a knowledge space is Alex. And Alex is also one of the most widely used and successful adaptive learning systems. And here you see a very small subset of the Alex knowledge space from Al S's paper. Within a knowledge space, or really any knowledge graph, one key concept to understand is the concept of the outer fringe. The outer fringe says, okay, here's what you know. And here's the set of knowledge components that can be learned next. That outer fringe is the set of things you can learn next. You could also think of it as your zone of proximal development. Now, Essa notes in his paper that knowledge spaces and knowledge graphs can be built by humans and are fine using data. But they can also be discovered totally from data, just completely bottom up. We'll come back to this within VVSD. So how are prerequisite knowledge graphs used by adaptive learning systems? There are three main ways they're used. First, to place the student in the curriculum. So sometimes some systems, like Alex, will give students a quiz at the beginning of use of the system, and then they'll uh, use a prerequisite knowledge graph to figure out from their responses efficiently where in the curriculum the student is. So by, um, with a well-designed knowledge space or knowledge graph, you can use a small number of items to figure out in the whole span of what the student has to learn where they are, place them so you don't waste their time with stuff they already know, or have them work on stuff that they're not ready to learn. Prerequisite knowledge graphs are also used in a lot of systems to pick or recommend the next topic for the student to work on. And in other systems, when a student's struggling, one of the possible explanations is they didn't actually get the prerequisite solidly. And so some systems will send you back to the prerequisite for a struggling student. Now, importantly and dismayingly, knowledge graphs today are trade secrets. Khan Academy shared theirs at one point, but as far as I can tell, they don't seem to do so anymore. Assistments shares an old one, but it's not very extensive. Companies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to build good ones, and they build them over and over. So many different companies around the planet have built Algebra 1 and middle school math knowledge graphs. So there's lots of repeated effort and wasted money. Here's an old screenshot of the Khan Academy knowledge graph. I'll pause for just a second so you can take a quick look. You can see that there's uh, a lot of stuff, and this is just a very small portion of a very big graph. Now, in terms of the impacts of knowledge graphs, Zoe and her colleagues found that students learn more if teachers follow the recommendations about which skills the student's ready to learn. In that paper, the Learn to System allowed the instructors a choice about whether to assign students stuff that was that the system thought they were ready to learn, or whatever else they wanted. And they found that if teachers followed their recommendations, they did better. Note that in this paper, they use both a knowledge graph and mastery learning, BKT. 
These uh, can be compatible approaches. Now I'm going to go on to a brief digression about the implications of the math. And I'm not going to go into the math in great detail, although you're more than welcome to do that yourself. But knowledge spaces, because of the way they're set up mathematically, sometimes tend to be overconfident about student knowledge compared to Bayesian networks. They typically make decisions based on much less evidence. They'll take one correct answer as evidence that you know a skill. And as we know from the last lecture, there's guessing and slipping. As a result, knowledge spaces can be quite efficient for curricular placement, but they can also make mistakes. Bayesian networks have a different flaw. They sometimes tend to over-propagate information. If they're configured in what are honestly standard ways, and they're not calibrated properly, they'll sometimes adjust estimates of skills very far away from the one the student's learning now. Uh, for example, um, a student does a problem on um, multiplication, and the system says, oh, okay, well, addition is a uh, prerequisite for multiplication. So they got it right on multiplication, so we can also up their estimate on addition. And hey, subtraction is related to, to addition, and if you know addition, you're probably more likely to know subtraction, so let's update the estimate on subtraction as well. And while we're at it, let's just update these 17 other things, kind of in decreasing and decreasing increments. So this is not necessarily a desired behavior if you're using a mental learning system, and it takes a lot of data to properly calibrate Bayesian networks. So that can be a real issue with them. Overall, um, Desmarais has written several papers showing that Bayesian networks fit data better than knowledge spaces. And this is actually an interesting research trajectory, which shows what a good scientist and good human being Michel Desmarais is. Because Michel came in having been one of the people who developed partial order knowledge spaces. And people said, okay, well that's great, but really, won't Bayesian networks fit the data better? And Michel said, no, 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 no. I'm going to prove it to you. I'm going to collect the data. Um, and I'm going to show that knowledge spaces fit the data better. And so um, Desmarais collected the data. And lo and behold, Bayesian networks fit better. So he published it. But he said, well, maybe this is just a special case. So then he collected another data set. And lo and behold, Bayesian networks fit better. And Desmarais said, okay, Bayesian networks are better. Even though he worked on one approach, when the data showed he was wrong, he changed his mind. That is sadly uncommon in the annals of science, where typically these kind of changes in perspective come when the next generation comes through. Damaray is a good scientist. Be a good scientist and a good practitioner yourselves. Be open to finding out you're wrong. I'm wrong six times a day. Now, knowledge spaces are still popular because data fit is in everything. And there are many cases where the assumptions and flaws of knowledge spaces are a better fit than the assumptions and flaws of Bayesian networks, which is why they're still used. So let's wrap up with some key takeaways. Many modern adaptive learning systems use prerequisite knowledge graphs to pick what a student should do next or for initial placement. And this can lead to much more efficient use of student time and better learning. But they're expensive to develop, and the lack of open knowledge graphs means that they don't get used nearly as much today as it would be good to see.